Greetings. This is Russ Anderson with an advanced tutorial on lens centering and calibration. Now SynthEyes and all your other 3D applications make a, a fairly simple assumption about the geometry of the camera, how the camera works and what the correspondence is between the positions of things in 3D and where they wind up on the image plane of the camera, whether that's a sensor chip or a piece of film. Everything is assumed to be nice and linear and no distortion, but as you might have guessed, the, uh, the world isn't really so ideal and a lot, of, a lot of things can happen in the cameras and the lenses that makes those assumptions not really necessarily true. So in this tutorial, I'm going to take a look at some of that and what to do about it so that you'll have more understanding at least of what's going on and what problems to look for uh, even if you don't necessarily do all of this on any particular shot. So taking a look at the shot here, this is just a view of a lens calibration grid and the camcorder was bumped in a little bit in the zoom periodically every couple of seconds and then I went back and pulled a single frame out of each of those steps so that I have a sequence of these different frames and it shows the camera zooming in on some particular place. Now this is a Canon HDC SD9 camera, I think a little, little camcorder that's part of my stereo pair. This is actually camera calibration, that's why uh, stereo calibration, that's why it looks a little kind of skewed. Um, but this is typical, so this is like a thousand dollar camera, same exact thing happens with my three thousand dollar cameras and probably as long as your camera costs less than your house um, probably this is there to some degree uh, in whatever you have. So we're going to start out in this process by creating some check lines on this innermost rectangle because we're going to be following sort of where each corner of this rectangle goes during the zoom sequence of the camera lens. So I'm just roughly setting up these lines and I'll be tuning them up exactly in just a second. So now as we zoom through the sequence, see those you know corners are heading for the edges of the picture. So uh, once they get out near the edge, the last visible frame, I'm going to go and set the outer position of each of these check lines. Uh, exactly into the corner of that line. Oops. Created a new one instead there by mistake. Here we go. So we have a little further to go on the uh, other corners. Now, if you watch what happens, you know, you'll see that each of these corners is following a nice straight line towards the center on each of those frames. Now, if we think about that sequence continuing indefinitely, we can do the following. We'll go to this innermost frame and now I haven't really set the inner corners exactly, but I'm not going to do the most obvious thing. I'm instead going to extend these lines further. So I'm still looking, you know, I'm looking at this corner up here while I'm adjusting the end of the line down here. And I'll do that for each of these different lines. And you start to see, you know, what's going to happen. All of these lines converge, you know, more or less at a single point. And this point down here 
is the center of the optic axis of the camera. That's telling where things that are infinitely far away would appear. It's also the point around which lens distortion takes place. So the lens distortion is radial, but the center of that radius is this point that we've just discovered by looking at the zoom sequence. I point out you might be able to do the same thing with a uh, bunch of prime lenses by putting different prime lenses on um, if, if they're fixed lenses. Um, you don't really need very many um, to do it. Really, two would be enough. So now we have this, this lens center. Let's find out really where it is. So if you look down at the bottom, you'll see the uh, status line is showing the position. And the center is down here around a U value of 0.025 and a V of 0.056. Okay, and the X is like 983, 984. Um, this is 1920. Half of 1920 is 960. So this is all about 24 pixels away from the actual center of the picture. And it's that 24 pixels, it's 24 pixels away from where Synthize is assuming that the actual center is. So we can go and you know search around here for a little and find out where that spot is. Just looking at the status values. So the actual center is about where the cursor is now. And you can see where that we've determined that the real cursor, uh, where the real center is. So there, there's quite a, a difference there. And it makes a difference in how perspective occurs. And it makes a difference in how lens distortion occurs. So let's start taking a look at what we might do about this. And I brought up the image preprocessor here. And the first thing that you can do is pad up the image using that center value. And I have a little checkbox on, so it's, it's kept the aspect ratio the same. Um, kind of added on both sides here, as you see. Um, so that the center of the image is now in the... Uh, you know, the spot that we calculated to be the center of the image is now really at the center of the image by kind of shifting everything over a bit. So this image now, if we feed this image into Synthize and into Max or Maya or Lightwave or whatever, C40, um, those software packages are all going to be getting what they expect. Because these images, like they are, have the center of the image is the spot where the optic axis of the camera is. Um, so next, let's take a look at the distortion. And, you know, obviously you can see that these lines at top and bottom are bent, which is telling you that there's distortion is present. So we can create check lines here in the image processor, preprocessor as well. And now let's start adjusting the distortion values. And there's, there's some fun and games to let this happen. Um, you'll notice that the ends of the check line kind of follow along. And you can adjust both the quadratic and the cubic values here to straighten things out. And, you know, exactly what you need is going to depend on what the kind of image is. So here there's not really too much cubic distortion in this particular lens, it looks like. And you can go and create a whole bunch of different check lines. So normally if I was doing this for real, I would be making both of these, you know, at least the outer view of full screen um, and probably making the image preprocessor window larger also. You can look at both of them uh, simultaneously. The um, main window can be helpful for zooming in on some particular area while you're seeing the overall image here in the image preprocessor. So you can create a whole bunch of different check lines and adjust things, keep on adjusting those parameters until uh, everything comes out straight. 
And one thing, just so you don't get confused, if I go and I look at a different image, you know, here's the next image in. Well, now everything looks curved again. Oh no, my values must have been wrong. But but no, you know, this is just showing you what I think you should already know. You know, the distortion values are particular to a given field of view of the lens. So the distortion values are largest when the camera is wide open. Now these other frames have a much narrower field of view and the lens is not distorting as much so I could actually turn off the distortion and now they're, they're straight again because those images are really okay in the first place. So the lens distortion calculate distortion values do correspond to a, a given field of view of the camera. If you're going to calibrate ahead of time, about the only spot that you can pre-calibrate is the widest open setting because most of the camcorders won't let you get back to the same exact field of view, you know, using the controls. They're not really too terrific at that. Um, if you have, if you've got a better lens on it, you might be able to to do that, but uh, a lot of them don't. Um, another tr interesting aspect to this, you know, this here, you know, is obviously part of a lens distortion uh, workflow, and you know, there's the two different main uh, workflows, either generating corrected uh, output, you know, linearized output, or doing the recompositing with the original footage. So you can do the same workflows here. There's something a little trickier that you can do though, um, which is there's a script that lets you drop down a check line across part of the image that you know the physical width for. So if you know what the width of this is, and you know what the distance from the camera to the test pattern is, you can have the little script compute what the field of view is. You then put the, uh, the field of view in here, so I don't know if it's uh, you know, 55 degrees, say. Now you can go and adjust what you're doing and what you've got to get a cleaned up linearized image without the padding but because Synthize has enough information to do this even as I'm wiggling things around the, the right center of the image is being maintained. So you can go and now output this image and it'll still have the optic axis smack in the middle of the image like you need. So hopefully this gives you a bit more of a view behind the scenes of what goes on in the lenses and how you can take a look at what's happening and what kind of equipment you have. Something to keep in mind and, and learn by. When, you, when you're seeing systematic patterns in the errors of a solve, Whenever you see systematic errors, those are being caused by effects like this, the decentering in the lenses or lens distortion. So you might want to come and take a, a look at the lens if you can and see if you can see uh, what the story is. And I'll point out that no two cameras are the same. I have uh, two of these particular cameras and they're both different by quite a lot. And part of the story there is that the spacing of the pixels on the sensors is so small that when you put the chips into the holes on the board, I think just the, the little bit of slop back and forth in those holes is enough to cause these kind of errors. And the camera manufacturers aren't controlling for this at all. They just build it and it's up to us to figure out what's happened and uh, be able to do something about it. Thanks a lot.